Okay, welcome everyone. This is the Community and Economic Development Committee meeting, and we have a little bit different routine for introducing ourselves because when sometimes we make a recommendation for the assembly, we want to make sure we have an appropriate quorum. So Manny's going to go through, do a roll call for assembly members. If we have quorum, say we have a quorum, and then we'll go through like typically and just introduce the people who are going to. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Weddleton? Here. Mr. Traney? Here. Mr. Peterson? Pete, say here. Say here. Say here. Okay. You got it. Ms. Timboski? Here. Mr. Compton? Here. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. And we also have. I'm uh, Dean Gates, in the council. John Redman. I'm Jordan Huss with Great Northern Cannabis. Steve Shields, Great Northern Cannabis. Ryan Yell, Planning Department. Mandy Honest, Clerk's Office. Forrest Van Bar. Phil Steyer, Chugach Electric. Debbie Wall, Municipal Clerk's Office. Sam Dobson and Gina Ashman as interpreters. Thank you. So first up is um, Great Northern Cannabis. And you guys can sit up here. And then we have on the phone um, Jason, is that right? Mm -hmm. Can you hear hello? Jason? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Jason Brandon, right? Yes, thank you. Um, if you want to speak, just um, say hello or something. We'll call on you, Jason. Okay. okay. Um, Man, do you want to go through? Uh, so, Great Northern Cannabis, this is their second retail. Um, it's going to be over on Diamond, where the old wine house used to be. Um, so all of the general licensing requirements have been met. Uh, the safety, health, security requirements have been addressed in their operating plan. There was no taxes, fees, or fines found due by any of the licensees or affiliates. And there's no additional conditions which are recommended for the license. the AR. Uh, that, that's correct, Mr. Chair. The line 41 on uh, section 6 of the AR uh, it states that uh, the marijuana license approved in section 2 as far as August 31st, 2018. That should be, that's a typo. That should be changed to 2019. So is that when we get this meeting? Will that be correct? Or the meeting? It's it's out already. Um, what do we do? So uh, we can do it at the meeting, which is via quick. Yeah. Okay, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the applicant, Great Northern Retail Stores Incorporated, doing business as Great Northern Cannabis, is applying for a special land use permit for marijuana retail to total approximately 2,117 square feet of space within an existing commercial use building. Uh, the proposed facility is within a B3 district, generally located northwest of the intersection of Renai Place and West Diamond Boulevard. And the address is 1901 West Diamond Boulevard. Planned hours of operation are Monday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to midnight. The closest protected land use is a religious assembly, which is Cross Point Church, located approximately 201, or 200.51 feet away, as measured in accordance with uh, the Criteria Municipal Code. Uh, the site has retained non-conforming rights for building encroachments present on the property, the lack of visual enhancement landscaping, as well as the lack of parking lot illumination, pedestrian amenities, and site design standards. Uh, this use is consistent with the Anchorage 2040 land use plan and the West Anchorage District plan, and the provided site plans do not show any major alterations to the building facade or structure that would make it up to similar character, scale, or size when compared to surrounding structures. 
and the planning department recommends approval subject to the conditions as stated in the assembly resolution and staff report. All right, thank you. Any comments? So um, you guys are really, really, really close to church. So tell me what engagement you've had with them and any feedback that you've gotten. Well, we haven't, uh, we haven't uh, had any direct engagement with them yet. And we also haven't received any feedback or they haven't uh, contacted us either. I would uh, clarify that uh, the church is over 1,000 feet away, actually, as far as uh, uh, to the door. It's located on uh, that lot across the across West Diamond Boulevard is uh, extremely large. There's the Burlington Coat Factory there, and there's a gymnasium and so forth. And the church is on the far side of that, so there's no vision. You can't see the church. Uh, there's no line of sight visibility, um, and, and so uh, the 200 uh, foot measurement is, of course, from lot line to lot line at the closest point, and it's just it's such a large, massive lot that uh, becomes a factor. Uh, so. Because of that, we, uh, we just haven't, haven't engaged yet, and, and we haven't heard from them either. So. And I don't know, I, I don't believe that we've received any protest ever. Yeah, but the real question, though, is do they, do they actually know? I mean, I've gone through this with, um, with people um, frequently, the land use issues, where people will be within 500 feet, and they'll say, well, we had no idea this was even happening, and that's what what I'm afraid is going to happen as soon as we, this comes to public testimony. And so my point is, um, it's it's beneficial to you to be proactive and go talk to them before it comes before us because that's what happens frequently is you get kind of, amb I don't want to say ambushed, but you kind of get caught off guard when people come and you'll have 50, it's a church. I mean, what if you have 150 people show up? You know, they have, I don't know the size of the congregation, but that's why I'm asking. I mean, it's better to be proactive than reactive. Sure, sure, sure. I would highly encourage you to do that before. Okay. This comes before. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, this is kind of a unique situation with this uh, scenario. So if you look at page 37 of your, your packets, um, there's kind of an air photo that has some uh, labels of businesses in the area. So if you look at 1901 West Diamond Boulevard, that's where the petition site is located. Directly south of there, there's a large building with Burlington Coat Factory. On the very south end of that building, that's where the Cross Point Church is located. Uh, that is all one lot. So with the way that the separation distance measurements are, um, that 200 foot separation distance from lot line to lot line to all protected land uses, that is the uh, separation distance measurement that they were unable to meet prior to subdivision. Um, the petitioners actually subdivided the property to cut all of a square so that they could actually meet that separation distance lot to lot line. So that's where that 200.51 feet, that's why we know that's so exact, because that's to the tenth of a foot um, uh, certified by a registered land surveyor. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, uh, that property is within 500 feet of the petition site, so in, in terms of notification purposes. So they did receive a public hearing notification from the planning department, and it's, we use the same list, or we send the petitioner the same list that we would use uh, to send out notices of public hearing that they use for their notice of community meeting. So I'm not sure if the church discarded that or if they didn't care about it, but um, they did receive notices twice. Does it go to the church or the property? Um, it would go to uh, property owners and tenants. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You guys go to community council, Stanley Community Council on April, was it? I guess so. We've been, been twice out there. Twice, twice, yeah. Twice. Yeah. Twice. Any response from the community council? Positive. Really yeah. positive. Are you guys going to try and get an on-site license if the state authorizes on-site consumption? Not at that location. It's just not sufficient square footage. Okay. Any other comments? There, there was a comment on maybe Ryan's section, page eight of fifteen. It says a health permit shall be obtained. That's not in our condition. Is that taken care of? Yeah, 
I believe I had that as a advisory. Right. What's the difference between an advisory and um, an advisory would just notify the applicant of that requirement from a separate agency. But it wouldn't necessarily be a condition of uh, special use permit approval. Oh, it's not, oh, so it's not typically. Yeah. And that's generally part of the licensing. So we didn't receive any comments to uh, from the health department that they were protesting this. Or okay, so that issue. Not, so they, because it was maybe already taken care of. Like, There's one comment here, and it's probably, maybe it's typical of this, is the um, trash screening. Maybe, or it's because uh, you're reclad, so maybe some rules kick in, but it says fully enclosed. Is fully enclosed when you say three sides? Is that fully enclosed, or does this mean also have a uh, So if three sides can fully screen it from the right of way, then that's typically acceptable. But in this case, um, from Bernay Place, um, you can clearly see the dumpster when you're driving by or passing on that right of way. And the code states that it cannot be visible, or it must be screened from on um, all rights of way um, if within 600 feet. So in this particular case, this, the solution to that would just be to add a, a gate to fully enclose it. Okay, Sorry. so the rule is, is screen it. Not, it doesn't say three sides or four, so if you need to have a front to hide it, then you have to do that. Okay. Great. The gate's been ordered, so that will be installed possibly tomorrow. Oh. And you hopefully followed. We had this big long discussion with a different business that had trouble with trash handling. Okay. And so it's almost not just screen it, but protect it. Yes. So are, are, how are you? Handling your waste. Well, at, this, at the retail locations, we don't have a, we don't usually have a lot of waste. Uh, we're, we're very careful in how we manage our inventory so that we don't overstock and therefore don't end up with product that expires. Um, but uh, obviously, Amco has its own set of requirements for waste management, which we comply with. Uh, I can refer to our cultivation facility because that's a location where we obviously have a, a significant amount of waste. Uh, we uh, we uh, of course collect our waste. Um, we enter that into metrics so that AMCO has uh, 72 hours as required by regulation uh, to come inspect it if they wish. And then we render it useless, uh, uh, mixing it 50 50 with something like sawdust or, or paper, shredded paper or whatever. Um, and then we've actually learned what works for us is to keep the, the waste secured on the premises uh, uh, before garbage day. We, we don't uh, take our waste and put it in the dumpster and let it sit there for three or four days. Uh, and the reason for that is we found that people were trying to break into the dumpster. And it's amazing how resilient these folks can be. You can have padlocks on it, you can have, we had it fenced in, we even had razor wire along the top of it, and they always found a way in. Um, of course, there was never anything in there they could use, but it didn't, didn't uh, really matter to us because they would still dig through our trash. And on you know, one occasion, we actually had some trash that got drug out and was on the, on the grounds there, and we didn't like the way that looked. So after that, uh, trying to secure even more, doing everything we could think of, realizing that wasn't going to work, we said, okay, we're going to have to hang on to this waste, and we'll put it out on garbage day, in the morning of, of trash pickup. And that's all the problem. We've never had another incident since. Um, and, and that's, of course, at a location that has a substantial amount of waste. At the retail stores, again, we typically don't have anything other than just trash, like paper trash, or, you know, office waste. But so are they breaking into your uh, dumpsters at your retail location? No, no, we haven't had any problems That's at retail. Problem. We're having problems. We had problems at the cultivation side for, for back in the beginning, um, and that's the one on Cinnabar Loop. That's in, in uh, uh, the Abbott Loop Community Council area. Uh, but like I said, we, we took immediate action to correct that problem. And we've, we haven't had any more incidents. Uh, so we'll continue to lock this dumpster at, at retail, uh, even though there really won't be any marijuana waste in there. We don't expect it to be any, but. We just don't want people rummaging through our trash, and from, folks always seem to think there's something valuable in there, and they would realize it's associated with a marijuana business. So. Do, do you have a metal lid? Uh, we do it at the cultivation. We have heavy metal, that, and they were still, or we, we have a metal bar that locks mm -hmm. it down, right? They were just cutting the padlock clean off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They came in with tools, and it was mm -hmm. amazing. They, they cut through the chain link fencing around it. They're, they're just, it's, it's amazing. If they would yeah. just use that energy for something positive, imagine what they could accomplish. <laughs> Okay, good, thank you. So just curious, uh, the subdivision that you did, um, previously we looked at this, the discussion was around variance, and obviously variance is an expensive and crapshoot of a process. And so you settled on a subdivision. 
what's the cost relative to the the variance process for that? Well, I don't think we ever value, uh, evaluated the uh, potential cost of a variance. I think that uh, the, the, the information and feedback we received in that discussion was that that was a long shot, and understandably so, to, to go in and, and, and ask, uh, particularly for this industry, that somehow we exempt the rules or, you know, let somebody do something that circumvents the rules with special permission. It just didn't make a lot of sense. So, and, and I always felt strongly that, uh, that this needed to be done you know, in strict compliance with the, the way the rules are written. Uh, so even though the variance was discussed initially, uh, th that really kind of uh, uh, came up out, out of suggestion by the surveyor. And uh, I didn't think that was going to be very acceptable and really didn't even want to pursue it. So uh, after that meeting, I was 100% convinced we didn't want to do that. And uh, we decided to just go ahead and, and take the subdivision route. And it did definitely cost some money to do that, thousands of dollars to go through that process. But that's just the way it is. The rules are written the way they are, and they're not, in my opinion, intended to be waived or, or bypassed with or without permission. <laughs> so I'm, I'm comfortable with the path we chose. Okay. So you're really in a mall, though. You're like a little island, and there's a mall wrapped around it. And you've contacted all the other tenants in there? They've been, mall? They've been con of course, they received the notices that we sent out. Uh, uh, we had the community council meeting. I didn't. I don't recall any of them showing up at that. Uh, the property owner, who is our landlord, obviously owns the entire mall as well. And the feedback I've received from him is that the tenants uh, are, are excited about the increased traffic. There's a Pizza Hut over there, for example. There's a Thai restaurant in the same shopping center, and they're optimistic that their businesses may actually receive increased traffic just from the folks coming to our store. So I, I, I've, I've actually been pleased that we didn't get uh, the, uh, a resistance. I, I thought we might. You never know, right, when you're putting in a marijuana store, what your neighbors are going to feel like. And in this case, going to the community council meeting and presenting on a couple of different occasions, uh, the, the response was overwhelmingly supportive. People were asking, when are we going to open? How many jobs are we creating? What you know, positions are we hiring for? So I, was, I was real pleased with that, uh, that experience. So, as far as I know, everybody's, I, of course, like, as Mosky said, and you never know until you get to the assembly here, right? There may be some folks that aren't happy, but, uh, Perhaps we should go door to door uh, over the next day or two and, and visit with folks and just introduce ourselves. It's, 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 it's sound advice. Um, yeah, and my, my point is just to try to mitigate concerns before you get there because it, it wasn't to be negative because, you know, I'll just be honest, I'm, I've had the opportunity to tour a number of marijuana facilities and, and maybe in part because, you know, one of the owners is a former assembly member. He really understands how the public process works and what concerns and how to mitigate. But I've had nothing but um, I've been very impressed with your operation and your professionalism. And um, I think really you guys um, have risen to the gold standard of what people should try to do. And, and, and I just appreciate the fact, whether it's concerns about smell, whether it's concerns about whatever it has been that you guys have taken them seriously. So again, my comments were not meant to be, um, to try to torpedo it. It's just, you know, you always try to mitigate concerns before they actually get to us on the floor because they're much harder to deal with there. I appreciate the feedback and I agree with you 100%. Okay. Thank you. So I know that Jordan, you have been directly managing the downtown store pretty closely. Uh, is it you who's going to take over this operation to begin uh, with? We have a store manager that's kind of managing the day-to-day. -day. Um, I help where I can. Um, I kind of bounce around between our cultivation and our retail store. So, yes, I will be involved with the diamond store as well. And are you going to be kind of the chief point of contact or someone else? Uh, I, I'm one of them. Definitely one of them. Yeah. So, I asked that question because for you know, the better part of two years, you worked really hard with the downtown community council and what's it have become much more functional than they were when you started. Indeed. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that one of your members will join the community council to be part of their process as well. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I presented to the Santa Community Council on two different occasions and um, just got a lot of good feedback, a lot of good support. Um, of course, there were tough questions and we answered them the best we can. Um, I live about five minutes away from that diamond retail store, so that is my community as well. And I do, I take participation in that very seriously. Maybe you have a sense, but why, why don't they give do MOUs for marijuana? I mean, that was my understanding of the packet here. For the, the, the Sandlin Community Council? You know, I reached out to Nikki Rose, who was the president of the, at that time, 
And um, we never got any feedback from her. And I asked her on numerous occasions if, if she was willing to, to sign an MOU and to uh, you know give us their blessing. And they, they just kind of took a just a middle of the road approach and, and didn't respond. We had the same experience with the downtown community council as well. At the time, they did not do MOUs. And I think it's because they didn't want to show favoritism one way or another. They, they support business, but they didn't necessarily want to advocate one way or the other. Change. Yes, change that has changed. That has changed. And we have signed an MOU with the Downtown Community Council. Of course, I'm a part of that that assembly, and uh, and we participate. Thank you. Did some community councils chose not to decide? There's nothing we can do about that, just that community council. That seems odd, though. I mean, it's really just a document to say who to call, when, and where. Exactly. Yeah. They have changed from some community councils, my friend. Hmm. <laughs> and we do take our, when we give our presentations to the community councils, we take a hard copy of our slideshow, and, and there's always a slide in that that contains our contact information. Um, it's multiple names on there. Your name's on, on Tipsa and Jordan, and I put my name on there with my cell phone, so we uh, and encourage folks to email us as well, or call us direct, uh, or of course reach out to the community council. Uh, we try to give them every possible avenue to contact us if there's ever an issue of concern. I mean, Literally, I don't mind if, if a, a community member calls me on my cell phone. It seems kind of odd, right? But that's part of it. I want to, I want to hear from them if there's any issue, because we can't resolve the issues unless we know about them. Good, yeah, thank you. Yeah. I just would suggest you guys go talk to the minister of change point, mm -hmm. cross whatever it cross is. Point, cross point. Just go and talk to the yes, minister. Sir. That way, you'll know if there's anything coming towards the cell meeting. Mm -hmm. I'd rather know earlier than on Tuesday. Okay. You have ten or twenty people show up. Thank you. We'll go talk to them. Thank you. Jason, anything to add? Nope, I don't have anything to add. I think the points about um, contacting the church are, are very well taken, um, and I appreciate um, Assemblymember Dombowski's comments about how Great Northern has strived to really be a model in this industry, um, and this situation with the lot line and the door-to-door -door distance being um, way further back than the lot line does create a unique situation and we just really appreciate um, all of the staff's assistance in, in working through that and helping us get this application in front of you. Thank you. So, do we have a recommendation? I recommend we approve this. Any oppositions? Okay, great. Thank you. See you Tuesday. Thank you very much. Only one objection. Too much paper. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's getting so many more. Like six pages for each other. Yeah. We got to come up with it our way. Right. <laughs> okay, so. Next up is continuing a discussion of the um, possible changes in how we handle um, changes in ownership, which you guys have something, Great Northern Cannabis has something related to that. So we looked at this in May and asked Dean to draft something up that would generally parallel what the state does. And we have something in front of us now. And I just off the Great Northern Cannabis, what's your timeline? We're, uh, we just, uh, we're, uh, our, the two asset transfers that we're going to, uh, to these new entities we formed, uh, they were, that was just approved by AMCO this week with delegation. Uh, so <coughs> it'll kind of be in a holding pattern. <coughs> Jason, if he's on the phone, can, can chime in on this as well. But uh, it's my understanding that it's going to be you know, in a holding pattern until the municipality. Can you come back up here so I can hear you? Some of these canaries going crazy. <laughs> Sorry, I just have a hard time. No, it's okay. I, I'm sorry. Uh, so yes, we've got two license transfers that are that are in, in process right now. Uh, Amco approved them this week in their meeting. Uh, the Maryland Control Board approved them this week um, with delegation. So they'll basically be on a holding pattern until the city uh, approves as well. Let's just protest. Um, I. Uh, understand there's a code issue with the city, that's what you're probably going to talk about now. Uh, so we're ready. Our timeline is as soon as this gets resolved at the city level, we're ready to transfer. And it was just a, there's no change in control or anything like that. This was just a corporate uh, structure that we were building. Um, we have 
you know, Great Northern Cannabis, which is mentioned that as a holding company, right, with all the shareholders. And then underneath that particular umbrella, we have Great Northern Retail Stores, Great Northern Cultivation, and Great Northern Manufacturing. They're all, each of them is a C corporation, and the only shareholder is Great Northern Cannabis. So that's kind of how the ownership uh, works with these. So there were tax reasons and, of course, uh, liability, uh, risk mitigation for doing that. Those were the reasons behind it. So it's been it's been going on for several, I guess probably close to nine months now. It's a lengthy process to get through the state and, and get to this point. Um, so on the agenda for the 23rd, you will see a um, AR for Great Northern Cannabis for their state transfer license. Um, so Mr. Gates and I spoke about this and we have um, provided a wave of protest for the transfer of the state license but didn't mention anything about the municipal license. Um, due to the time we got the application from the state, we're now at the deadline of the 60 day for one of the applications. So that'll be before you for that and then we can deal with the municipal license through this process. Okay. Is, is it your view that what they're doing is a transfer of a license or is it just a change in ownership? Um, so we currently have an application for a transfer of ownership because we don't have the transfer of license. The state has it as a transfer of license because they allow that. Um, and as he said, it's the same entity um, that's just being, it's the same owners and they're just changing the liability and the corporate structure. Corporate structure. So um, I will admit trying to go through the state application to sort out whether it's a transfer of controlling interest or a transfer of ownership was difficult and I called AMCO to get information on it and they said the best way to um, find that out would be looking at their um, ad in the paper to show what's going on. So. And ours, as we've gone through it, is, does it make it easy? Our views? Um, currently, it makes it impossible. <laughs> so, <laughs> what we so what we discovered um, going through it, and what we discussed before we actually had the transfers before us that this was a potential issue, is their state license will transfer. They'll have that state license number. We've been matching their number with the M in front of it to keep it consistent. Um, if we don't allow the transfer of the license, they would have to go through our whole process all over again and apply for a new license, and then they wouldn't match, and it would be trying to, to marry those two together. And in reality, as we discussed before, with the transfers of the controlling interest, they there have been transfers that are similar to transfers of the license through the ownership anyways. It just makes it really convoluted to try and follow all of those transfers of ownership percentages. Um, and if the transfer of the license is allowed for the muni as it is for the state, I think it would just make it a lot clearer for <coughs> following the path of ownership. Okay, good. So that tells us how complicated we <laughs> so Now Dean can tell us how he simplified it. Do you want to go walk us through this? <laughs> well, um, I hope it's simplified. That's the goal, and that's absolutely right. And uh, I've tried to draft this with code changes, so some of our language is similar to the states. And I'm going to try to point out where it's still different. And um, there's this is a draft form, and this is the first time anybody's gotten to adopt this draft. And as I uh, said, Mr. Wilton, uh, we had some discussions about it and what approach to take in some language uh, from a couple of months ago. And uh, I usually would have this draft with you, and you and Andy before you <coughs> come to you, but that didn't happen. So it's the first good for everybody to take the grain of salt. And um, we do expect some further changes. So I already have one after talking to um, Ms. Fonis this morning. So uh, let me, I guess, just get started. And um, like the title says, we're making similar to the state license ownership. So the first page, um, 
we have a change to subsection E, 1080, 10 license restrictions. Uh, this subsection E, the state and the state regulations in 3, um, 306, 3 AC 306, um, section 10. Our uh, code structure follows the similar numbering as the state's regulations numbering. So there are 10 matches there, 306, 10. They don't have this subsection E at all, but they do have A through D, which is uh, almost the same as our code. So our E's in addition, and it just says that uh, something you see repeated in other sections of the code later. The uh, license isn't transferable uh, from the specification where it's issued. So it changes and reads language about um, not transferring ownership. The uh, list at the bottom uh, talks about surrendering the license uh, within 10 days that operations cease. Um, the rest of it, I have a bold at line 34. Maybe we could read the rest or we can leave it in there because it talks about an exception for um, sole proprietors who are just uh, establishing a legal entity, LLC or corporation. And uh, I'll Later, you will see that one reason that's an exception here is we're not requiring assembly approval for those kind of transfers for sole proprietors setting up an LLC or corporation in their the one individual own 100% shareholder. So, um, let's see. So, page two, uh, a lot of text you see here is my drafting process where I inserted the whole chapter and uh, went down to what we're changing and left some in for context. So, um, 10 and 15, I don't have any changes to the section, but I've included provisions that are um, relevant to uh, transfer and ownership and so forth. And uh, you'll see it, 1015 C's also showing a license for a specific location. And um, you see that repeated a few times throughout here. So again, maybe YE on the first page isn't necessary, but um, it doesn't hurt no harm in doing so. So my next change, uh, I think you will see on um, page three towards the bottom, it's to 1080, uh, 45, and we're adding to the title for transfer of the license. And um, the language here, uh, you'll see at line 49, I've changed language to uh, applying for a transfer of ownership and receiving the written consent. Uh, so we have a few different types of transfers. There's a transfer of a controlling interest, right, where the named owner isn't changing, but the shareholders or LMC or uh, members are changing. That's a transfer of controlling interest. Then we've got the ownership change, where it's less than 50%, not a controlling interest transfer, and that's just reported. And the controlling interest is simply approval. So this transfer of the ownership of the license is something different. And in this draft, we see transfer of ownership. And after talking to Ms. Honest this morning, we're going to change that term to say transfer of the license. So, and that would be, I guess, more in line with how the state classifies theirs, and we hope. I guess organize and administer the transfers better, the forms you use, and so forth. So, uh, isn't that right, um, Ms. Honest? Um, so, when I was reading it, I think if we just leave applying for a transfer, because then that would include all three types. So, they have to apply for a transfer, and that would include all three types listed in the title. Are you talking about line 41, page 3? Um, for page 3 on page 40, or on page 3, line 49, um, where it says without applying for a transfer of ownership, I think if we just said applying for transfer and receiving the written consent, that applying for the transfer would imply the two that would require the assembly approval. Is that, does that make sense, Steve? Yes. Does that make sense? It does. Would it also, on line 41 in the title of that section, would you change that? Where it's transfer of a license, just very transfer? I, I don't think so. I think what mm -hmm. she's saying is she, she would leave that there because down something. below it, it would refer back up to this is the Those section two. we're yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 So, um, yeah, the next marked code change is uh, page four. 
So um, the search exceptions uh, for when, I guess, assembly approval is needed um, for a transfer and uh, either transfer of control of interest or transfer of ownership. So B1 is the new paragraph that recognizes what I pointed to on uh, the first page, where sole proprietorship is uh, forming an LLC corporation. And so this day may be approved by the municipal clerk at the end of B1, you know, at line 9 to 10. Um, so it would be reported, of course, to the assembly, but it doesn't need a resolution for the assembly and a vote of approval. And so that's what I've drafted here. That doesn't have to be that way. If the company or the assembly first have those go to the assembly for approval as well. So one thing to consider is policy choice. Uh, and then B2 is just, um, that's existing language, and that's about a death of a owner, either the proprietor or a uh, partner or shareholder or a member of an Um so much of the rest uh, is changing to uh, the language so that recognizes transfer of ownership instead of just uh, controlling interests. And I guess at line 34 on page 4, we changed that in the application to transfer instead of ownership. So we cover all of them. Um, and then I've inserted this sentence at line 40 to 43. Um, it was to clarify that. You can't make an agreement and transfer my license effective the October 1st. You have to wait for the single approval before that transfer can actually take place. For the single approval, you can add conditions at that time on the new transferee and so forth. And then it would authorize the clerk to uh, do the actual you know, physical paper license transfer after all the conditions are met. And uh, she could do that administratively from there. So that sentence is intended to say, uh, we don't care what your agreement says, you can't transfer it into assembly groups. So, um, and of course, I uh, welcome that it's that language so that it's clear for that intent and purpose. Um, so, page five, we've got another change at lines 12 to 13. Um, again, just clarifying uh, what actions the clerk takes. Um, and I guess the rest as well at uh, the bottom of page five. Um, these just indicate um, that if it's this, well, subsection B at the bottom of page five is simply saying, well, this is controlling true store license transfer in C section 045 that we just went through. So um, the rest of 046 is if it's less than controlling interest and changing the ownership. And uh, page six is also just to be consistent with that. I have to look at uh, paragraph five at the bottom, at the top of page six, line 13. It's not necessary anymore. It's changed. Um, it, of course, references in paragraph four, the uh, 45 one the sole proprietor transfer ships exception. Um, the rest is mostly for context. There's uh, to affect the transfer of a license. It's mostly in that section of 45 and 46. So the next change you see is um, just uh, language transfer of ownership instead of license. And I'll be changing that in our next update, uh, as we recently discussed. And page seven is a change yet. Um, 1080-80C, it's when denial of license application, and C is about when it's for transfer. And uh, we'll see a change from well to nay that we've already got in place and that we're already made. I just wanted to put it in here to make sure I don't overlook that other uh, change that's occurring. And then um, mostly the rest of this document, page eight and nine, is a uh, language that was relevant that uh, I considered Maybe we need to change this whole uh, transfer of license uh, change, but I didn't see changes needed, but it's there for context. And uh, do bring it up to your attention if you see any other places where things need to be changed for the definitions. Uh, I didn't think so. But um, again, what the sort of initial middle stage of drafting. Uh, any questions at any time?
I think I think we're on the right path with this. I think um, clearly we were going to have to address this, and I think I think we're on the right path. If Mr. Weatherton is okay with it, I'd like to be added as a sponsor. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I, I guess the question is, um, do we want to? We we're just seeing this right now. We could submit this and get it in the process, have it introduced. You're going to make those little changes, though, Dean. Yeah, we'll do a little editing instead of transfer of ownership, call it transfer of license, you know. I think that's the only substantial edit yeah. that we really need to do. Unless you have more. Well, if we get it introduced, we could actually substantially change it sure. as we look at it closer. Right. Um, I think we'd at least get some progress. Because we've been sitting on this since May. I think this is a good starting point. Okay. Let's get it in the system. Because we can always work out work sessions or something else. But if we keep the sink delay, it's going to take longer to keep the system to start. Good thing. So I start forgetting what we did. Me too. I had to go back and read it. So, Dean, if you can make that one change, I think it's ready for introduction. Okay. So, for timing, um, if we submit tomorrow by noon, this could be on the agenda just for introduction. For October 23rd, Tuesday night. Sounds good. It's at the public hearing for November 7th or later. So if you want to do it, that, that's the fast track, I guess, in the schedule. I'm okay with that. I'm going to have a chance to look at it. Um, do you want anyone else, other names on here? We put Amy and. Put me on. Amy, Ford. send me to it. Yeah, we're we're we can goal. do the whole committee, yeah. big old party. Do you want to do the <laughs> So committee plus fourth? Yes, plus next official member. Chair? He's just making it up now. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. Um, one question on this we have okay. AMCO had a few recommended changes that are in play. So this was September 4th, they sent us this proposed change, comments due by October 7th, but it was, I don't know that these are. Really relevant to us in, in regard to conversions, but that's when you have two different kinds. They have two different kinds of marijuana: them, the small ones, and the bigger for cultivation. But we just do cultivation, right? so that's not relevant. Yeah. And then they have um, concentrate and manufacturing. We just do manufacturing, right? so that conversion discussion is not relevant. Are you familiar with that? Right. Yeah, we oh, we just this? have the four types for our license. We don't break it down into the smaller, whether it's the product manufacturing or just the concentrate manufacturing. It's just right. kind of over. So it it doesn't seem to be applicable for the changes. We would still fit within theirs. Did you see this, Dean? The proposed now um, changes? I didn't read it carefully. I, I saw it in by email, but I didn't read it. I will read it and make sure there's nothing that affects the transfers that it's on the okay. list of things to do. Right, I, I, don't, I don't see that it impacted us at all. And, and then they, there's a discussion mm -hmm. in the same document about trans, how you, that they can sell concentrates, and I think to deal with that issue that we saw with that one. Mm -hmm. and that, is that an issue with us at all? That, no, that really deals with <clears throat> how they were doing stuff with metric and I think it's just clarifying that they're allowed to do that kind of transfer. So we don't really monitor the transfers of the products. Right. That's the state, and so that really isn't part of our stuff either. Okay. I also think that in our process, when we get marijuana manufacturing exceptions, um, it's more handled through our Title 21 special land use permit for marijuana approvals, because as we saw in the uh, uh, in Title 21, we have that. Uh, different treatment for the downtown area for manufacturing facilities and the type of concentrate extraction processes that we used to concentrate to the extraction, but uh, we don't have that otherwise. And that would relate more to the building and uh, construction of the building. Is, is that right, Ryan? This is out of my area of expertise, but uh, yeah. I think that we don't handle it as a license being separated in for concentrate for other types of manufacturing, like cookies and edibles. You have the buildings laid out. Yeah, that, that's correct. So, um, for manufacturing in Title 21, uh, manufacturing within the B3, it's uh, closed loop and carbon dioxide only, um, or, or other methods that aren't that don't employ you know butane or, or any type of explosive. 
materials. Um, as far as the uh, construction of the walls, um, uh, Title 21 doesn't necessarily address that, but Title 23 with building safety standards. So. And I don't know if that's relevant here. So are you looking at when AMCO proposes changes or makes them, do you look through them and see if there's anything that would impact Title 21? Anything that it would impact Title 21 or our regulations, I look at, but um, we've just been so busy lately that anything that's license related, I, I trust right. Mandy and I trust her opinion on that. So, uh, I guess it gets off track, so we should focus. So, we want to move this forward, put it on the agenda for introduction, this is a public hearing two weeks later. Okay, so finish with this. Anything else on this? That is officially done um, with our agenda, but well, if I could. I'm sorry. So if I go forward, I guess I should read some whereas statements here and send it to the um, sponsors for review. And um, one issue with that is with the meetings out. Uh, concerns were on you. You can, can leave me off of the of that. You can leave me okay. off of those emails. If Even without you, though, the county's five people and more than three is an open meetings that concern. So um, maybe if I just send to the chair for the bylaws stuff, but, um, I think that the rest of the county trusts what your judgment and whatever I'm changes you have to be. Right. So they expect to know things the same. Now, not being really substantive changes, you know, as to what the county's approved. Can it just be whereas what we have now, which is way too complicated? Yeah. <laughs> this is not, we only have a bunch of whereas on this one. Mm -hmm. so if you want to, um, we could touch on it before the public hearing on November 7th, because we have a November 1st meeting here. So if you wanted to bring it back and just review oh, right. any of it again. Uh, another option is um, no whereas paragraphs, and just have an AM from the chair. Mm -hmm. I Sure. And clearly, we're trying to make sure, make sure there's a way to facilitate license transfers for these, these special circumstances. Okay. So I'll work on that with me. Either whereas is and if they am, not come forward and we'll have it. We'll have another meeting before the public hearing. So if we can put it on the agenda, I'll just shut it on and then we can just glance at it real quick. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anything else, Jason? No, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, and, and you know, we should send this out to the industry too. Mm -hmm. We got it done. So we get, how, how, what is uh, like? Well, we made some changes to the rules. We sent it. I think Jason might be on the list. Jana is. I mean, is there? How would? How do you keep track of what we're doing if we change the laws? Do we have a paper? <laughs> With AMCO, it's pretty easy because they send out the notices to everybody. Uh, with the city, we just you know rely on Jason to help us with that. We try to we try to uh, review the, uh, the website. Uh, just and I talk to the folks at planning, so it's sort of just using all available resources. But there's no real systematic way that I'm aware of maybe to identify a potential opportunity. How about uh, yeah, like here? What's the Carry 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 club or group organization? Oh, like uh, the cannabis uh, business association. Business, yeah, the Anchorage Cannabis yeah. Business. Yeah. Does he get word out on these things? Um, sometimes uh, we have meetings with the Anchorage Cannabis Business. They try, they do, they try to stay tuned into the changes pretty well, uh, especially on the state side because Nick Miller's obviously mm -hmm. on the board there. Um, but yeah, and at the at the local level, the uh, Anchorage um, Municipal Cannabis Association, they have bi-monthly or uh, bi-weekly meetings. And they do a pretty good job of keeping uh, everyone updated on, on changes and what's on the municipal agenda and what's coming up. Yeah. Is that Chris Usher? ACBA, right? Yeah, ACBA. ACBA, ACBA, yeah. Oh, okay. And is she, and there, are they on her email list? Yeah. Okay. Um, good. Because we want to make sure you know, because you know, your feedback on this is really important, especially because you have so many owners and you're in the process of it. So when we, We'll make some small changes to this, and it'll be introduced on Tuesday. Okay. And if you could look, I'd be happy to look at it. If it doesn't work for you, you can let us know Absolutely. as soon as you can. And we'll have another meeting that'll be on our agenda, and then, of course, at the public hearing, we can do more with make sure. sure. No, we appreciate the opportunity to comment. We, we, we uh, always comment on proposed regulatory changes at the state level. So, since that's part of the public comment process, we, we always participate. 
and uh, just happy to lend our, our uh, expertise from our perspective and, and then let the decision makers uh, make their decisions, at least based on all the information that they can obtain. And if it's perfect, you can just write a little note saying, way to go, Dean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <a job. laughs> so, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if I could just, one other thing is we do have, um, MCO has proposals for on-site on -site consumption. We had sent comments a year ago when they proposed it. And I went through this briefly, and I don't even remember what I thought. But it, it opens the door, essentially, but we can do whatever we want. Uh, say no. So, how do you want to handle this? I haven't read their proposed things yet. Yeah. I read it either. I'd like to read it, but the thing is, it's got to conform to municipal second hand smoke and the state's second hand smoke law. They took it back one October. You need to take both those in conjunction with these changes. For example, do you know vaping is not prohibited when you pull into a window at a quick stop, at a, a little restaurant like McDonald's or something? You can't vape there. Otherwise, they send you away and not serve you. Really? You change the state law, yeah. Because it's too close to a window. Yeah. It's got to be 20 feet from the window. <coughs> so we need to take a look at the state law and our secondhand smoke ordinance as it affects the work. Because I was talking to one person in the industry. They said, well, we're going to have a separate sealed area so that it would not affect the customers who didn't want it. My question was, what happens to the boys? Well, they just have to put up with it. We don't have secondhand smoke, whether it's tobacco or marijuana, to affect people's health. So it's going to be interesting. So if this passes an AMCO rule, is our default no? Well, we have where, a, where are we then? If we it, do nothing in the pat in the if we do nothing, it's not allowed in the municipality. We'd have to change our laws. I think. Mm -hmm. So the default is no. Yeah. Um, so the state's recent secondhand smoke law that uh, went into effect. I, I looked at it recently, and they have. Uh, uh, I guess for some tobacco stores, they can have an area where you can smoke indoors and enclosed area. Yeah. If it's exclusively for that sort of information and so forth. Um, I didn't mention no marijuana, so I guess maybe they'll treat that separately with this uh, regulation um, proposed change. But uh, we did see that in our secondhand smoke ordinance. The new state law, there's some inconsistencies, so we might look at updating our code to be consistent as well. The recent state law change if needed. So I'm not sure the preemption and the level of local uh, control will be can be different for that. I'm doing good that. So that's I think they're just more restrictive. I think if we didn't want theirs, we'd have to send the voters to change ours. We'd have to have attorneys let us know. Looking both the city and the state law. Because the purpose of both of these is to protect public health, whether it's deployed and people that are there. What do you mean, send it to the voters? Yeah, was the first one done by plebiscite? I don't know. There's something I saw in the state law that you could exempt yourself, a city could exempt themselves out of the second oh, yeah. by submitting that to voters. I'll think, take a look at it. I don't think you have to go to voters. Well, I think, think you did. Our second hand smoke ordinance, there's provisions in there where you can still smoke if you're like. I kind of think it's it's like uh, if, you, if you don't you yeah if you don't have employees and you don't this I mean there's ways you can get around it frankly um, currently um, but it's been a few years since I've looked at it but I know it is the default is I mean the municipal code doesn't allow it there are exceptions like I said if you don't have employees and stuff um, so no matter what the state does I think you're gonna have to. If you want it, you're going to have to go back and revisit it. Because when we did our marijuana, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. When we did our marijuana laws and stuff, one of the ordinances I remember we passed specifically added marijuana to the smoking ban. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, I think um, they could use modern technology so the employees wouldn't have to be present in the smoking area. Either just make a window so you can observe or set up a, a camera. You already got lots of cameras going on already. Set up another camera and they can just watch what's going on on a screen without having to, the employee actually be present. Let me be true, Pete, but what happens if you've got an emergency or a police officer or, or a paramedic has to go in there? They're then exposed to marijuana smoke. Then they have to take them off duty. 
because they've been exposed to that and they're public safety officers. They can pick so we're going to work this. Yeah, I think we should, yeah, we should bring this <laughs> up after okay. the state does their right. thing. Okay. So, and I would offer, there are ways to flush this a room really quickly with, uh, from one atmosphere to another. Oh, but if you're going to allow marijuana, you might as well allow but, tobacco too. But that's not really important. <coughs> what's important is we don't have it allowed under any of our licensing right. schemes. Right. And in fact, there's just no way you could shoehorn it in without an active right. move of this law. Okay, I want to make sure of that and see if we want to make comments on this. And since they do leave it up to us, as long as this goes through, we have allowed it. I didn't see any restrictions on what we can do. I have not read that one super thoroughly yet. Let's do it. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I got the Senate bill for this state law recently, so I just and I pulled it up, and um, it's SB 63. Uh, Mr. Trony is right, though, for municipal regulation and municipality by ordinance ratified by the voters can exempt itself from this state law. And that's section that would, that would AS 1835 to Exempt from the second hand smoke? Yeah, you can go to the voters and they could say, hey, it's going to be exempt from uh, smoking law. But I doubt seriously they'll make it through the voters in Anchorage. Because remember, when we passed the smoking law, then it went to the referendum of the public, and that refer referendum was disapproved by the public. So our second and smoke law went into effect. I don't think it's changed. Okay. So. Anything else? Can we adjourn?